Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. A very intriguing panel coming up right now, dealing with fluke. And I say it's intriguing because we have representatives from New Jersey, North Carolina, uh, Southern Florida, but the gentleman fishes all the way up through New England. And I'm going to define this as being not so much flounder. Flounder, the true flounder, is being a right-eyed fish. The fluke, or also southern flounder, is the left eye fish. So what we're calling fluke, a lot of northeast anglers could relate to that. And as we refer to it as flounder, that's your Carolina anglers in south but pretty much the same fish, at least it's close enough for government work. So I want to introduce my panel here. Out of New Jersey, one of the red hot young guns, this guy could do it all from the offshore scene to the inshore, Ryan DeGraw. We've got Captain John Owens out of the Wilmington area, North Carolina. Crazy Alberto Knee, the one, the only. Alberto, um, I like to keep saying, he spends a lot of time down here in the Southwest Florida coast, but he fishes everywhere from the Southeast Florida coast all the way through New England. So we'll leave it at parts unknown, but what is a prime fluke environment that somebody can look at the water in, in the bottom machine and say, you know, I think I'm gonna have a shot of catching fluke here. So you definitely wanna look for really contoury bottom. You don't want flat bottom. You want a lot of contours. You want structure. Structure is another huge thing that I feel like a lot of people overlook. They'll see the contours and they'll think, okay, contours, let's start fluking. Um, I think it's very important, important to make sure that you have hard bottom as well as structure never helps or hurts. I'm sorry. Um, but now, now when you're finding structure and you're saying hard bottom, is this just like some rocks mixed with some mud? Are you talking about heavy duty structure? It could, be, it could be either or. Um, I find that different times of the year, fish tend to stick more towards one or the other. Um, I think earlier in the year, definitely um, a lot more fish on str harder structure like racks and stuff like that. And uh, once the water gets a little bit warmer, the fish kind of move inshore a little bit and they'll post up on uh, rock piles and just hard bottom with a lot of contour. And is moving water critical for, for finding them? So moving water isn't critical for finding them, but it is critical for catching them. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely need a drift in order to uh, have a good day of fluke fishing, I would say, but um, Again, it's, there's little ways to get around it, but moving water is definitely well, a big perfect. plus. Perfect, yeah, we're gonna get in those little ways to get around it, because I know you're an ace when it comes to fluke, and I'm gonna sort of grow you on some of your tactics here, but shifting gears, John Owen to the, the Carolinas guy over here, and you're known for pulling some hellacious size uh, fluke or southern flounder out of those waters too. So I mean, some of these fish could push double digits up there. And you heard Ryan talk about trying to locate them, and I've done some trips in your part of the world too, but, but to find an area. Say I'm coming in that zone and I'm fairly new to that area, but I want to start fluke fishing. What am I looking for? Am I fishing in creeks? Am I fishing towards the inlet more? Am I fishing offshore? Give me a little quick history of where we're going to find these fish. In the spring, I'm, I'm mostly ocean fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, artificial reefs from two to six miles. These fish will go as far as 20 miles offshore on a regular basis, but I'm in that two to six mile range. Uh, ledges, artificial reefs, uh, and typically what I do is I start on the reefs in the spring, and then as the reefs start getting fished out, getting, getting hammered, I start moving to hard bottom and ledges, coral bottoms, hard bottoms, reefs, uh, natural reefs, where those fish don't get hit as hard. Um, and, and really it's just structure, and it can be just a little bit. There's sand all around these structures. You just get on that hard bottom. It doesn't have to be high relief. A lot of people want to go for that, those big drops. But those little six inch and one foot drops are loaded with flounder in the summertime. Gotcha, now, given that that fish pretty much stays flat on that bottom too. Is a fish finder essential? Does, does that aid you at all in any degree? 100% because if you're not on the structure, you're not on the fish. I mean, so you got to, I mean, I, I, I probably couldn't run flounder trips on those reefs without a fish finder because what I look for is everyone goes all the way to the, to, straight to the big structure, 
kind of get on the outside edge of the other boats and, and find just that bumpy bottom. You're going along, you see the soft bottom, the sand bottom, you start seeing a little bit of color in that in, on, on the HD fish finder. You start seeing that color, you know you're getting some hard bottom. It doesn't take much. And if you fish that lower relief, you get less hangs. Gotcha. Alberto, again, you're a knockout artist when it comes to catching these monster fluke. And you're listening to Ryan talk about some of the spots up around Jersey or what to look for in that part of uh, New England. You have Jot down there discussing some of the structures around the Carolinas, the Southern Atlantic. What can you tell us that maybe they haven't already in terms of trying to get really dialed in and, and maybe not so much catching the numbers, but trying to get that one giant one that, that you're so well, well known for? Well, uh, first of all, they're spot on. It's all about structure, structure, structure. Defining the structure, like you said, ledges, rocky bottom. And people don't understand, these are predators. They migrate. I mean, I've targeted them from Rhode Island to New, uh, New York, North Carolina, even down in Florida. So essentially, you could catch them all year round, just knowing where they are. And in the month of May, New England area, the biggest of the biggest will come in but based on porgies and squid. Those are the key. And look at in September, Charlie Nappy, the world record, 19 pound plus, caught in September. And that was caught in 86 feet of water, southwest of Montauk, and it's all rocks. So it has a lot to do with structure and then the techniques. In which we're gonna get in here shortly. And I also wanna play some moon phase games, but right now we're gonna play games and run some commercials by our sponsors. We'll be right back. If you're enjoying the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We'll come right back to Talking Fluke after this commercial break. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. And let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. We're in the teeth of a fluke fishing session, or Southern Flounder, if you're from the uh, mid-Atlantic down south. And um, Jock, what could you tell me about what you see your migration down off, say, the Southern Atlantic, the Carolinas, as far as an inshore offshore movement? So, so for me, we talked earlier, you know, that usually in May, I start to look for those ocean flounder. Um, and there are some fish inshore in May, but as, as the summer goes on, especially later June and July is when those bigger Southern flounder really start to make their way into the sounds. Um, and that's when I kind of switch over from a numbers game to looking for the bigger fish, especially those Southerns inshore. And so that usually right into June and July, I'll start hearing some social media reports. Oh, someone so called a five, someone so called a six. Those fish are showing up. And as we lead up to early fall, they, they get bigger and bigger. I'd say for me, trophy season for those big Southerns inshore is going to be September and October. A few fish in November, but September and October, that's just when, when, the, when the big dogs are in there. And then we're starting to find them on this in, uh, that inshore structure. You know, docks, um, ledges between docks. The, the nastier, the bigger a dock is with more oyster growth on it, with current flow, you're going to find your flounders in those places. Gotcha. Ryan, up at Jersey Way, in a couple of trips that I've actually run out of Atlantic City, I see a lot of people, at least during the time I was there, fishing the inlets there for flounder. When do you see the flounder start getting into your inlets? So early on, the flounder fishing does get really good in the inlets because a lot of the fish will come straight in from offshore and push into the back of the rivers. So we usually see pretty good numbers early on in the spring back in the rivers where we can really catch them good up on flats and right on the edge of uh, big channel um, drops. Right. <clears throat> um, whereas in the fall, we'll be focusing more right towards the, uh, the inlet Got you. Now, in the inlets, where do they traditionally like to hang? And you got the whole inlet, you got the teeth right down the center, you've got tied against the rocks, you got the mouse. Is there any particular place that they like to stack up? So I would say that wherever the bait, wherever most of the bait primarily holds in whatever inlet you're fishing is going to be where I'm um, targeting those flukes. So trying to you locate the zones with the bait and those yep. flukes ought to be Especially down in the fall when I'm looking for bigger fish, um, those fish in the inlets are going to be feeding before they move offshore. I think we need to cut to the chase here, guys. Mm -hmm. You know, an inlet. Let's talk about an inlet. You know, these are predator fish. An inlet on the outgoing water, that is like all-you-can-eat buffet. Everything gets flushed out in the spring. You got the, the Achilles, you got the Spearings, you got the, the squid in, in, in the mid part. 
outgoing, you have, like you said, finger mullet, tremendous bait fish. Um, but for, for the most part, outgoing water, ledges, cove, cuts, rips, they're all there. And depending on the part of the tide, when the water is really moving fast, you know, they kind of hucker down. But when the water starts slowing down, the big doormat and the format comes out and play. And that's what you got to do. Does anchoring come into play at all for fluke or just mainly position yourself over the area and either power drifting? Jot, I'm going to throw this to you. So if I'm doing power drifting versus anchoring, when that comes to mind, that's going to be that May through early July ocean fishing. Uh, and for that scenario, if we have very light wind and the current isn't too bad, I want to drift. The problem is, is if you start drifting too fast, you're dragging the bait, you're not jigging, and then the hang up just as a guide, we're getting hung up left and right. So I would prefer to drift because I cover area more efficiently, uh, but there's plenty of times where I need to, I just need a vertical jig. Well, let's take a look at what you have, and I want to get real quick here with the pound test leader that you're running on there, and more importantly, the subtleties. When you're dropping that down, what kind of action? Are you trying to mud it a few inches off the bottom? Are you trying to bring it up three or four feet and drop it? Give me the leader and give me the subtleties of working jigs so, for fluke. So ocean fishing, uh, I'm going to be using a three quarter ounce to one ounce jig head. Um, if the fish bite's good and there's some big fish, I might go to an ounce and a half, two ounce bucktail. And I'm typically going to tip that with some kind of rubber swim bait or a scented um, like jerk shad or fluke style. I prefer to go scented, but if the, if the trash fish are beating me live, I'll go with a rubber bait like this. Um, and then on the inshore stuff, I like to go with a, a, a smaller jig head, but with a long shank, uh, a long shank. Okay. Just so we don't miss any of those smaller fish that could be keepers. Uh, and I'm gonna rig it with the same stuff, the rubber, rubber swim baits or a jerk shad. Uh, ocean fishing, I'm gonna use a 50 pound fluorocarbon leader. And that's mostly for the abrasion resistance, not really the clarity. Uh, and inshore, I use 30 or 40 pound fluorocarbon. And how I pick on that is really, if we're fishing hard docks with lots of oysters, I'm gonna use a 40. If I'm fishing more oyster rocks and grass lines, a little shallow water, I'm going to be fishing a 30-pound floor. Gotcha. Made. And it subtly is a workout. What do you want that jig to be doing other than catching the fish? Yeah. How, do you, how do you get the fish on it? B bumping the bottom, jigging the bottom. So if we're vertical jigging, I have my customers just lifting the rod tip up and down. How 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 far up you want the jig off the bottom? Just a couple inches, not That's much. It, just That's, that, yeah, it doesn't take I want them to fill the bottom, hits the bottom, they come right back up, drop sink, and then docks, casting our docks, and bumping it to you. And the most important thing I can tell you is covering area. Our flounder down in our way will not follow a bait very far at all. They didn't get big by following a bait. So I want to cover that bottom. You know, every two or three feet make a cast. It makes a difference on what you'll catch. Absolutely. Very, very good. And then, Ryan, we're going to talk to you about some of your rigs. You favor jigging. You favor more of putting natural baits out or live baits. And what are you going for? And, and then when we come back from the commercial break, we'll look at your rig. But what do you prefer as your go-to fluke setup? So if I'm going for numbers, I'm 100% using a jig. If I'm going more for bigger fish, I'm going to be using a live bait. What kind of live baits? Uh, spot is a really good one. Finger mullet, peanut bunker, uh, live snappers. Those are all you know, some of my top baits okay. for big well, fish. Well, hold that note because when we come back, I'm going to look at one of your rigs and I want to talk to you about the subtleties of presenting live baits on the bottom for a trophy size fluke. Absolutely. We'll be right back with the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The subject, fluke. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures, for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The subject is fluke. I'm working with one of the young gun anglers out of the New Jersey area, Ryan DeGraw. And Ryan, we were talking about uh, sending live baits down for, on the bottom, but you have a specific rig here. Let's let's talk about that in particular, then we'll get into the subtleties of uh, doing your live baits. So the rig I have here is just a simple jigging rig that um, I would use pretty much anywhere. I'd use this rig in the river, in the ocean, anywhere. Um, I have a little clip right at the end here, tactical anglers clip that I like to use just because I can change out quickly if I need to go heavier or lighter on my jig. Uh, then I have about 16 to 18 inches of leader material. What pound before. test? If I'm in the back bays, I'll go as light as 12 pounds sometimes. And if I'm in the ocean, oh, my hook came off there. Most of the time I'm fishing uh, 30 or 40. Okay, and then you move up here, you got a dropper loop. What size hook? 
Use a uh, seven or eight op bait holder hook. It really yep. helps keep the plastic on there. And then uh, another, you know, good chunk, two, three feet a liter, and then just a swivel. And, that, and that's your rig? That's as simple as it gets right there. Are there any subtleties involved in keeping in touch with that bait as it's on the bottom? Do you want to feel a drag and do you slight lift it above the bottom? What are the secrets involved in that? I like to get my live bait down to the bottom. I like to feel my sinker hit. I like to take four or five cranks up off the bottom and then just leave my bait and just let it do its thing. And I would say that the, one of the biggest things about live baiting for fluke is keeping your bait good because you're not using big baits. Some of the baits you use are hardy, some of them are not. So it's very important to take good care of your bait and make sure that it's in hey, good Ryan, condition. Uh, can we talk about the intricacy parts about what makes you connect? Because when you're fluke fishing with bait, there's a lot of swing and miss. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. incredibly amount of swing and miss. What are the key things that we do? But what I like to do is, you know, if I'm using a bugtail, you're bouncing, 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 you zoom, you feel the thump. You cross her eyes right away. However, on that jig, you know, when she takes it, you know what she's gonna do. She's just gonna hold on to it. What do you do? You just feed her. Just give it to her, right? Yeah. Yep. That's Let one her thing eat a it. lot of people don't do. Okay, but how long do you feed? I, I've been in a situation before where you think that it, it's way too long, but then you find out it's not long enough. It's almost like you just keep paying. Well, <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> and I had my share of, of, of screaming and all that. One thing I found out, when you swing and miss, for the better part, if you feed it, open the bale, feed it back, feed it back, jig, 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 nine out of 10, she's gonna come back. When okay. she comes back, feed her some more. When you engage, you, you, you wait a little bit, when you feel that rod, a little tension, all right, guess what? When you feel that, heavy part, you cross her eyes. And the other part that people don't talk about is when you try to net her, guess what they do? They swim backward with mouth open, like, let me go, let me go. <laughs> and they'll get away most of the time. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing, Calcutta Outdoors, hard working outdoor gear, JL Audio, ahead of the curve, ACR, building survival products since 1956, Florida Keys and Key West, visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Yeah, a very good point, uh, Alberto. I like that too, when you do miss it on, on the live bait. Oh yeah. What you're doing is you're teasing. You're trying to make that live bait look like it's panicked, like it just got hit and it's trying to get away. It, it, and I think, what, it just excites the fluke to come back there even harder are, the next they time? They are opportunistic feeder and they're predators. Yeah. You know, right. if they see something and they'll go for it, they well, go for the kill. John, of all the years you spent, you know, fluke fishing, and again, you know, case Southern Flounder, again, same fish, what would you, rate as your number one most subtle thing that you do that might separate you from a lot of fluke anglers that you feel makes the biggest difference in your catch record? I'm going to tell you, and it's actually not presentation. It's what we're just talking about, hook set. So I'm a, I'm a big, I'm artificial when it comes to, to flounder fishing, fluke fishing for me, and it is because when I switched over artificials, we caught bigger fish in the same areas. I feel like the presentation's better. Uh, we're, we're bouncing, we're in a little shallower water. We're bouncing jigs, and the biggest thing is my customers and anglers around me are expecting that that huge thump, and it's not. It's it's rarely do we feel the fish bite. It's dead weight. So I tell my customers if they feel anything, set that hook. So jig fishing, there's no waiting. They inhale the bait. So when I'm inshore jigging or I'm jigging a ledge, my customers, I've had customers jigging before, rods bending over. I look at them and go, set the hook, huh? There's a flounder hold on the whole time. They were expecting a bite. Yeah. So I'm t I tell I would rather that it be a hang and they get a hang than to miss a flounder set. So I, I tell them, if it feels different at all, if you feel any dead weight, crank down and hit them hard. And it's very surprising how many times they come and then the eyes get big and there's a big old flounder on. So it's, 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 it's that hook set. Uh, we, you know, we discussed areas that like the moving water is very essential, but when a bite turns off and, and the tide goes slack, and those fish are not feeding because you really don't have the moving water to stimulate it. What are some of the little tricks that you could do to try to, get to, to convince one or two fish to strike during- Ooh, Can I chime in on this yeah, one? Yeah, during the slack. Oh, yeah. What do you it, do? It's huge. I mean, you, you, you hit it right on the spot. 95% of the time, all right, everybody talks about drifting. Am I correct on that? You gotta drift, you gotta drift, you gotta drift. Especially when you, you drift a nice hole and go back, let's drift back at that hole. And let's go back and, dude, stop that. <laughs> Come on. If you know the hole is there, 
anchor up and cast up current and bounce it and work it. You don't have to run it. And when the water slows down, you can jig it, you can work it and finesse these things and they will hit. So, you know, save a lot of money on the gas. You're right on the spot. You don't have to chase this spot. And you know that's a honey hole. And just work it. And just keep working it and working it until the water until starts the water moving turns. again and things turn yes. in your favor. Very, very good. Uh, I want to thank Alberto Nee. We got Judd Owens and Ryan DeGraw on that very informative fluke session. And again, I've always been intrigued by that fish. We don't see him in our parts of South Florida, but I always enjoy my trips up north and in the Carolinas and, and catching them. And I'll tell you what, when it comes to fine eating, oh, yeah. arguably... Or that's, sushi. <laughs> or sushi, too, as you well know, Alberto, that's right there. And it's a very formidable fish. So uh, one of my favorites that I wish I could do more of, but I appreciate the very informative session. We appreciate it. That was a fluke session by our panel of experts. You're enjoying the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now, adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door price drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door prize page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Hey.